So, let us continue our discussion on airfoils, the general shape and various nomenclature about an airfoil. Airfoils are the cross section of the aircraft wings and the general shape is at the nose or the front part is basically rounded at least for subsonic application the front part is rounded and then its thickness keeps on increasing up to certain distance reaches a maximum and then again decreases to 0 or nearly 0 at the trailing edge. <coughs> so, the round nose or the leading edge is rounded and the trailing edge may be either sharp or also may be rounded, but if it is rounded then also its thickness is very small compared to the front or the nose. <coughs> now, we mentioned that if we join the leading edge and trailing edge by a straight line that line is called the chord of the airfoil. Now, obviously, a question comes that okay, when there is a sharp trailing edge that is the trailing edge is point, then we can say that this is the trailing edge, but the leading edge which is always rounded which is actually the leading edge which point which point should we connect to get the chord. And same question also arise if the trailing edge is also rounded you know because of manufacturing difficulty many a many a time the trailing edge is not exactly a point, but also little rounded. <coughs> and in such a case how do we locate this trailing edge and leading edge the points. Okay, this entire region we can call it the leading edge region, but which is that point. Now, in that situation where there is a rounded nose obviously, the nose is always rounded the point of maximum curvature or the center of the maximum curvature that is located and similarly, if the trailing edge is also rounded then the center of maximum curvature at the trailing edge that is also located and these two points are joined and then extended to intersect their foils and wherever it intersects that will be taken as the leading edge point. So, we need to locate the point of maximum or center of maximum curvature at the front as well as at the end and then join the line and that is what is the chord. Let us say then that sorry we will have one more. The chord is usually denoted by C and it is a very important reference line because the incidence or the angle at which which it makes with the flight direction or the relative wind is called the angle of incidence or angle of attack and again that is usually denoted by alpha let us say if this is the relative wind direction then this angle is called angle of attack or incidence and it is usually denoted by alpha. Now, you can see that each and every cross section of the wing is such an airfoil and so each and every cross section has an angle of attack. The angle of attack may remain constant throughout the wing or it may change. If the angle of attack changes then that wing is called twisted. If the angle of attack changes because of geometric reason that is the, the chord is not on the same plane at all station we can construct the wing in such a manner that the chord at 
different cross section will not remain on the same plane. In that case, this however, the flight direction is same or other relative wind direction is same at all cross section. Still, the angle of attack will be different because the cord are at different plane. In such a situation, the wing will be called geometrically twisted wing. This twist is due to geometric reason. However, later on we will see that the effective angle of attack can still be different if the flow is in all direction, flow is in the same plane and the cords are also in the same plane. So, that when you measure the angle, the angle is same between the cord and the flow direction, but there is something called an effective angle of attack which will be coming at later stage that is different. That sort of situation may occur <coughs> and then that type of wings are called aerodynamically twisted wing that geometrically there is no twist. You are very familiar with what is twisted shape. So, in such a situation the wing will have no geometric twist in its shape, but still the wing will have effective twist because of aerodynamics. We will see later on how it happens or how it is provided, <coughs> but at this stage you should just rem remember that twist may be of two different type. It might be a geometric twist because of the manufacturing or construction of the wing, so that the cords are not on the same plane and there is another way by which we can provide a twist which is known as aerodynamic twist because a twisted wing means that the angle of attack is different at different angle at different cross section. <coughs> now, once we have this cord, if we at any point on the cord, if we just draw a normal or draw perpendicular, then it will intersect the two surface at two different points and this distance is called the thickness. This is what is called the thickness. And as you can see that the thickness will at the leading edge thickness is quite small, it will increase as we move away from the leading edge towards the trailing edge. At one point it will reach a maximum value and then again will decrease to nearly 0. The maximum thickness point is usually somewhere between 25 percent to 50 percent cord, usually in that 35, 40 in that range. 35 percent of the cord at that location or near about where is the maximum thickness for most of the airfoils that are used as a wing cross section. <coughs> now, if we take the midpoint of all these thickness at different cross section or, or at different station and then join them by a line. So, with respect to this line, this airfoil is now symmetric with respect to this line, this airfoil is symmetric. Same amount of the airfoil over above it, same below it. This line is usually called the mean line or camel line. and the maximum distance of this line from the cord, you would see this line is also not at equidistance from the cord, its distance from the cord changes from point to point. So, the maximum distance of this line from the cord expressed as a percentage of cord is called its camber, the camber of the airfoil. So, if we say that an airfoil has 3 percent camber, meaning that the maximum distance of the camber line from the cord is 0 0.03 c. So, the thickness and this camber are always expressed in terms of percentage cord. 
and their falls are usually characterized by this maximum thickness and maximum camber expressed in terms of percentage chord. So, if we mention that the airfoil is 12 percent thick that means, the maximum thickness of that airfoil is 12 percent or 0 0.12 c. <coughs> now, this is the wing cross section. Now, let us look to little bit of wings how the wing looks like though of course, it is not the details of it is not related to aerodynamics and we will be hardly interested later on of all these details, but still this is something all of you must know. The wing cross section is airfoil, but how is the wing? The wing is usually hollow, it is not solid. Besides providing the most important aerodynamic forces and moments and also providing support to the engines, landing gears and many other things, wing also served as the main fuel tank of aircraft. That the fuel that the aircraft needs for its operation is mostly stored within the wing. That means, that the wing is not a solid, solid structure, it is hollow. Only the shape is given by what is called the skin, which is just a thin plate, very thin plate. It is you can imagine that you have a sheet metal turned in the shape of the wing, which is quite thin. Of course, if it is just like that, then you can understand that because of the huge air load that the wing supports, it would not be able to sustain if it is just only a sheet metal, just only the skin. So, there are certain internal structures which gives the wing its strength, so that it can maintain its shape, because the shape is very important. These aerodynamic forces and moments that the wing provides just because of its shape. So, the shape must be maintained, but just if we have only a thin metal, sheet metal turned like that, then of course, the sufficient strength will not be there. And not only that, you know in early days of aviation, the wing skin used to be even of cloth fabric. And even now, small aircrafts they have fabric wing. Now, that of course, cannot support these air pressure or huge air load that the aircraft supports. So, there are internal structures, but the internal structures are arranged in such a way that the major part of the wing is hollow, which can be used as fuel tank. <coughs> so, let us uh, look to this little bit about this internal wing structures, not that they are directly related to our course of study. to give it sufficient strength and also to provide connection with the fuselage, there are some number of beams depending upon the aircraft it might be one beam or might be two beam or three beam, which are usually having eye cross section and extended from wing root to wing tip sorry and extended throughout you understood that 
these are eye cross section beam extended from wing root to wing tip. There will be depending upon the size of the aircraft there might be one, two or more of these. These beam type of structures are called spar and they provide the most of the strength that is necessary to support the loads. These are called spars. Of course, details of these you will be studying in your structures course. So, they are called spar. <laughs> also, there are longitudinal members to stiffen the skin. So, even if you have that two or three such spars, then also that the intermediate space between these two spars or ahead of and behind these spars, the skin there may buckle or may sub depressed because of the air load. The skin is quite thin. So, to provide support to the skin, there are stiffeners. Again, it is a very small beam, but they are not connected from upper surface to lower surface. They are attached to either the upper surface or the lower surface and they may be of Z section or C section or hot hat section and they are also extended from root to tip. They are called stringers or stiffeners there will be many such stringers or stiffeners to stiffen the skin. Stringers or stiffeners. So, besides these longitudinal members or sorry should we should call them transverse member with respect to aircraft, this besides these sparse and stringers and stiffeners there are other members which are called ribs in this direction and they are of all airfoil shape. they are called ribs. All of them are of airfoil shapes. <coughs> so, while constructing the wing this is what is done first those ribs are placed at appropriate locations. The ribs are manufactured in such a way that corresponds to the actual airfoil at that section and in those sections the ribs are placed then the spars are fitted and then skin with the stiffener is pasted on it or riveted on it on this frame and you see now there is empty spaces or hollow spaces in between. So, that is what the wing structure is. In this context, we will also mention that the wing it looks to be a one component, but actually this wing cross section most often is made up of or the airfoil is not made up of single component, it is made up of number of components. That means, in a practical case the airfoil can be something like this.
some cases it can this also can be even 2 or 3. Here I have shown that this air foil is in 3 parts, but these 2 parts which are now separated from this main part they can fit with it. So, that you will just see only a line when they are fitted together you will see just a line without any gap. However, they can be deflected with respect to or relative to this main component. Then these components are in generally called flaps. In generally, these components are called flaps. And then they are further named from their following the purpose that they are serving like this leading edge flap, this small flap at the leading edge is usually called a leading edge slat. Leading edge slat. Flap is a general name and there are specific name based on what purpose they are serving one say this flap fitted at the trailing edge of the wing can be used for two purposes. The one purpose is just to provide little higher lift during landing and take off. The aircraft when it lands or takes off needs little more lift than while it flies or rather lift coefficient little more lift coefficient we will say what those lift coefficient are <coughs> and these flaps deflecting these flaps that higher amount of lift can be obtained. Same thing this slat actually all these flaps that is the general purpose that they usually provide when deflected a little higher change in lift depending upon in which direction it is deflected it may increase the lift or it may decrease the lift. Usually if the airfoil has a positive camber and then the flap is deflected downward then the lift is increased. If the flap is deflected upward lift is decreased. So, on now imagine that on two wings we have two flaps. If both of them are deflected downward they will increase the lift which is required during landing and take up. So, during landing and take up these flaps are used only for that purpose to get enhanced lift and then they are called high lift devices. Now, think that in one wing it is deflected downward in a other wing it is deflected upward. What will happen then? In one wing the lift will increase on the other wing the lift will decrease and consequently then the aircraft will experience a moment about the longitudinal or what we call the x axis meaning a rolling moment. And in such a situation those flaps will be called aileron. When the flaps are used to provide this rolling moment they are called aileron. Now, in many aircraft these purposes are separated. See the flap is made in two part, part which is nearer to the fuselage which will call the inner part. Say if this is the root part say up to certain distance up to this part it is one and this part is again let us say separated. So, this rear part on the this near part on both the wing will always be deflected symmetrically that means both will be deflected downward together and will serve as high lift devices required during landing and take off. While this outer part they will be not used for that purpose they can be used only for providing the rolling moment. And since you know rolling moment is the moment about the longitudinal axis if these ailerons are towards the tip 
that is beneficial because in that case the moment arm becomes longer even with a small difference in force we can get larger moment. So, they are more useful if they are at the towards the tip. <coughs> so, at this stage that is all about wing we wanted to say <coughs> because these rolling moment and all those only our role here is to find the pressure distribution. Then how those rolling moments are coming and how the rolling moment is going to affect the aircraft motion is of course, the subject matter of flight mechanics not aerodynamics. So, this we will not discuss further, but we should know what those moments are and <coughs> what is their purpose, how they can be obtained or how they can be modified, because as an engineer that is also one of your job, not just to know that what the lift is for a given wing, but also to know how to change that lift or how to get more lift by changing the shape. Anyway, <coughs> the tail plane as you mentioned that there are two tail planes and both are basically small wings. So, their structures and almost everything are nearly same. However, none of them are usually having leading edge slat. Usually, no horizontal or vertical tail uses leading edge slat, but they do use the tailing edge flap, but not for providing high lift. I mean, that is not the main purpose. In their case, the main purpose of those leading edge flaps for the horizontal tail the leading edge flap is called elevator. The leading edge flap for the horizontal tail is called elevator. And once again if a change in lift occurs there, it again produces a moment, but this time you see the, the moment is about the span wise axis, meaning it will change the incidence either it will take the nose up or down, aircraft nose up or down and that leading edge flap of the horizontal tail plane is called elevator and it provides the pitching moment necessary to change the incidence of the aircraft. If we do not need to change the incidence, we do not need to use the elevators that means, we do not need to deflect the elevators, they will remain fitted with the horizontal tail as it is. Horizontal tail also called as a stabilizer, horizontal stabilizer. Similarly, vertical tail also called vertical stabilizer, because the horizontal tail and vertical tail they provide the necessary stability to the aircraft, that is their main purpose like the main purpose of the wing is to provide these aerodynamic forces required to fly, the horizontal tails and vertical tails the main purpose of them is to provide the necessary stability. Okay. See these are their main function, it does not mean that they do not do anything else. This horizontal tail of course, always produces certain amount of lift irrespective of whatever small it is, it always produces certain amount of lift, certain amount of drag. But that is not their main purpose for which they are used. Their main purpose is to provide stability and to hold those elevator and rudder. The flap of the vertical tail is called rudder. It provides the directional control, like it provides a moment about the vertical z axis, vertical axis and swings the nose to the left or right that means, it, it has certain control over the direction of the flight in which direction the flight should go and it is called rudder. The difference another difference is there that in most cases the airfoils used for horizontal and vertical tail are symmetric. 
or usually of course, there is no hard and fast rule that they have to be symmetric, but most cases they are made symmetric and in wing they are always camber. <laughs> Before we proceed further, we mentioned already about lift coefficient. We will just mention what those lift coefficient and what do we mean by that. The lift coefficient is nothing but the non dimensional form of the lift force. It is customary in aerodynamics to express all these force and moments in terms of non dimensional coefficients, in terms of a non dimensional coefficient. So, this lift coefficient you must remember certain things that lift coefficient let us say denote it by C L and lift force will denote by L is a non dimensional form of it and the non dimensional or the normalizing parameter is half rho u infinity square into s you can see that the denominator has a dimension of force. The half is used for convenience and rho u infinity is the called undisturbed stream velocity. We can also call the relative wind. As we mentioned then in aerodynamics, this is what is the convention that we consider the body as at rest and the fluid is moving with same speed. In actual flight, the body is moving, the air fluid is at rest. Here we consider the opposite, the fluid is moving, the body is held at rest. So, this u infinity, which you are calling the free stream speed, in actually it is the flight speed, the speed of the aircraft. <laughs> Rho is of course, the density of air and this s which of course, is an area and already you have mentioned what is this s, this is the plan form area. Remember this normalizing area is the plan form area, not the wing surface area, not the wing surface area, it is the plan form area. <coughs> and plan form we have already defined, it is the plan view of the wing extended through the fuselage. Even though the wing is not there within the fuselage, but for this case we consider the wing is extended through the fuselage and then the top view of it. If we look from the top whatever we will see that is what is the plan form and uh, this area is area of that plan form. So, as we mentioned that if the wing plan form is trapezoidal then basically it is the area of that trapezoid. As an example, if you have a cylinder, what is its plan form? A rectangle. Yes. So, the plan form area of that cylinder is simply the area of that rectangle, that is what we are. <laughs> Similarly, all other forces are normalized using the same parameter, half rho u infinity square s. The drag coefficient, the other force is drag coefficient sorry, drag force is denoted by d and this is the drag coefficient. 
Similarly, the side force coefficient, let us say C y, also can be written as the moment coefficient let us say the pitching moment coefficient, this is pitching moment coefficient C m, pitching moment is usually denoted by m, m by now this is of course, not moment half rho infinity square s is not a moment, we need another length to make it moment and the length is usually the aerodynamic chord mean aerodynamic chord. <coughs> the ewing moment is usually defined denoted by n not c, but b for the ewing moment that is the moment about the vertical axis the appropriate length parameter is the span length in that direction not the chord. So, here it is b the rolling moment here we need to be a little careful rolling moment uh, let us for the time being because we won't need it. We will be using less r. Of course, it is not the usual notation. For pitching moment and ewing moment, m and n are usual notation. For ewing moment, the usual notation is l. But we are not going to use that because we have already used it for lift. <coughs> so, let's write it r, and again it is. there is a little bit of conflict of notation in fluid mechanics and aerodynamics. In fluid mechanics the notations are much more straightforward, the three forces are denoted as x, y, z, the drag is x, side force is y, the lift is z and these three moments rolling moment is l, pitching moment is m, ewing moment is n, but in aerodynamics lift is always use the gel and hence we have a little problem while writing ro rolling moment. So, let us for the time being we write it L R. <coughs> now, when aircraft flies straight and level it is going straight. So, obviously, there is no side force acting. If there is a side force acting then of course, it cannot go straight and also since it is flying straight and level obviously, no moment is acting on it or all moments are 0. So, in that situation all three moments are 0 and side force are 0 only two non zero are lift force and drag force and <coughs> So, this lift and drag force are perhaps the most of most important of the aerodynamic forces and as we have already mentioned that these lift and drag forces and why only lift and drag all these forces come because of the pressure and stress distribution viscous stress distribution on the surface of the aircraft and mostly on the wing. <coughs> And once we get the pressure and shear stress distribution on the airfoil surface or the wing surface or to be more accurate over the entire aircraft surface, we can find all these forces and moments just a matter of integration. Once we know the pressure and the stress, we can simply integrate it over the aircraft surface and get 
all these forces and moments. In that process, one may be zero, zero. And <coughs> as we mentioned in the beginning, that the role of aerodynamics is to try to find out that pressure and stress distribution. to find that pressure and stress distribution. And not only finding the pressure and stress distribu distribution, also using that knowledge to change the pressure distribution or stress distribution to our advantage, which is the design problem. The design problem is as you are should apprehend that it gives you the task that this is what we need how to get it. So, the question may be like this that this is what the pressure distribution we should have, how to get that pressure distribution that becomes a design problem. And what type of pressure distribution we should have that of course, comes with little bit of experience and little study different type of analysis that what type of pressure distribution gives us the best result. So, we should try to get that type of pressure distribution and then we should look the look to the problem that if we want to have this pressure distribution, how we are going to have the wing, what type of wing it should be. So, the aerodynamics answer try to answer these two questions that okay, if this is the wing or this is the aircraft, what are the forces it will have and if we want to have a little different type of pressure distribution or stress distribution, how we will change our aircraft or we will have a newer aircraft with different type of these aerodynamics. <coughs> and that is what we will try to do over a number of aerodynamics courses and which we will try to introduce here. <coughs> now, the pressure distribution and stress distribution will definitely come from if we analyze the flow if we analyze the flow that occurs over a body. So, here now the problem completely change instead of analyzing the motion of the aircraft, we are now trying to analyze the motion the flow motion the flow. So, we should have certain as you know that to analyze any problem the first thing that we need is to set up some physical laws in the mathematical form which gives the answer to this or the mathematical model, mathematical model of the problem. So, the first thing that we should do is model this flow problem mathematically and then we will try to solve this problem. The modeling of the mathematical problem is basically nothing but expressing the laws of nature or the physical laws in mathematical form. And you are familiar with many such physical laws. I think all of you are familiar with these physical laws, conservation of mass, that is a very important physical law conservation of momentum is another very important physical law and so on. There are many such physical laws and so, if we can express them mathematically for our problem, we will we'll be able to set the problem in mathematical form. So, that will be the our first task and since our system is basically fluid so, we have to set up this system for a fluid system. You have already set up these systems for rigid body, you have set up these systems for some other elastic body or deformable body mostly solid. Now, same thing we will be doing now for fluid. <coughs> and okay, 
one more thing at this stage perhaps we should mention. Let us say that we know the pressure and stress distribution on the body. We have already said that now to get the forces it is simply a matter of integration. So, let us look to that integration at this stage before we start our modeling the fluid dynamical or aerodynamical problem. Let us consider for simplicity on only a cross section of any arbitrary body. to which the flow is coming with the undisturbed stream speed of u infinity. <laughs> Let us consider a small element of the surface. And let us denote this length by should we say delta s. This small arc length let us denote it by delta s. You know on this small element we have pressure and stress acting. Pressure you know always acts normally to any surface. So, the pressure is normal to the surface. and the stress is tangential we will let us call it tau. <coughs> then how much will be the force? We can have on set of x and y axis or x and z axis. The other direction is the y direction. Can you get the force? The force along this direction will be the drag force, force along this direction will be the lift force, okay, because this is same as the x. <laughs> we can even sketch the flow by something like this.
let us say pressure makes an angle theta, pressure makes an angle theta with the vertical axis. <laughs> pressure makes an angle theta with the vertical axis. Oh, sorry, pressure makes an angle theta with the horizontal axis. Pressure makes an angle theta with the horizontal axis or the x axis. P makes makes an angle theta with the x axis x axis is along flow along free stream free stream is the stream which is not disturbed by the body that means if there are this body were absent whatever the stream would have been that you can see that it is just a parallel lines represented by parallel lines with velocity u infinity at everywhere because of this body that will be disturbed <coughs> and that is called the disturbed flow. So, our x axis is along this free stream or along the direction of u infinity and then how much will be the lift force integrated over the entire surface into minus p sin theta plus tau cos theta into the area element. Area element how will get? We will consider a unit length along the y axis and we will assume that there is no change along that for the time being. Of course, if there is change in that then we will consider del into delta y or otherwise now let us consider delta s into 1. So, this is per unit span it is called per unit span lift force per unit span that means we are considering the span wise length of unity only <laughs> and similarly the drag force can be written as sorry this is integrated over the entire curve again this is drag force per unit span. <coughs> now, at this stage we may further mention that at least for the lift the major contribution comes from pressure. The contribution from this stress or shear stress tau is much smaller compared to the contribution from the pressure or rather it is almost negligibly small compared to the contribution from pressure. So, amongst the two as far as lift is concerned pressure is the most important and at least in this course and also perhaps next one or two courses on aerodynamics most of the time we will be discussing only about the process where we can consider only pressure not the shear stress. That is most often we will deal with the situation where there is no shear stress. The reason is that 
the contribution of shear stress to the lift force is negligibly small compared to the contribution from pressure. Of course, that is not true for the drag. <laughs> So, in our next lecture now we will move on to our proper aerodynamics with this brief introduction that what aerodynamics intends to do or what is the subject matter of aerodynamics, why it is required to do and then we will move on to aerodynamics from next lecture onward.